it is shocking that we have a new cell phone every few months, that we are going to the moon, that we're whatever, and with 30% of our people in America, 100 million people struggling now with depression and anxiety, according to a Census Bureau that was done, and that's, of course, because of the pandemic. One third of Americans are struggling with depression and anxiety. It is amazing that people don't know the facts. Depression's number one for disability in the world, according to the World Health Organization. It's not infections or whatever, it's depression. 35% of people don't respond to the existing medications and the SSRI Prozac type medications are 35 years old. Welcome to another episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. We've been busy this week. We've been uh, doing a lot of interviews with some amazing people. And today we had the chance to speak with Audrey Gruss, who we'll read her bio and, and make it official. Uh, but, but to say the least, she's made a, an impact in the world that you know very few of us will ever make and comes from an amazing background and story. And we had a f- great conversation with her. What were your thoughts, Josh? She has an incredible story. She's had such a rich life and such rich experience, but it's so fascinating how her family, like she said, they literally came from nothing. They left Lithuania during the war. They lost everything. They come to the United States and now she's engaged in philanthropy and starting, starting perfume brands. And that story is not super common, but it's not completely uncommon either. Whereas if you look back through the last 7,000 years of human history, that story never happened. I mean, maybe like Joseph in Egypt or something, you know, because, you know, God got involved or something, but it's like, it wasn't like you could just travel across the world, give up everything and then go somewhere else and become a billionaire. And yet people are doing that in numbers yeah. today. And it's just it's so interesting to talk to somebody who's been through that experience. Yeah. You'll, you'll be fascinated as you listen to, to the background and the stories. And I'm excited for some of the, the conversations that we have coming up next week with Guy Kawasaki. This is a conversation that we're gonna have about him kind of touching on a different part of his story. But these idea of these immigrants, we've talked to a couple already that come and, and make the impact and differences that, that they have is pretty, pretty remarkable. And her story is incredible. So Audrey Gross is founder and chairman of the Hope for Depression Research Foundation, which she established in 2006 in memory of her late mother who battled clinical depression for decades. HDRF's mission is to fund pioneering international scientific research into the origins, diagnoses, uh, treatment and prevention of depression and its related mood and other emotional disorders with the ultimate goal of finding a cure. That, that's her official bio. She, she, <laughs> there's so much more to it than that. She, uh, she's an entrepreneur. She, in the 60s and 70s, worked her way to the top of the corporate ladder in the beauty industry and then decided when, as a woman that when she was told that she could get a promotion without a pay increase, she said, no, I'm not going to do that. So she went and started her own international marketing and consulting firm, picked up some huge international clients in the beauty industry built an amazing corporation that was global and then eventually was married to her husband and decided that she wanted to get more into his philanthropic and her philanthropic endeavors. And so she sold her company and ever since then has started these foundations and has done incredible things. So, you know, she's some, someone you need to do a Google search on and learn a lot about what she's done. And and obviously this, this interview will, will help a lot with that. I loved how proactive she was. I mean, who learns Italian in order to do a business pitch? Yeah. You love that. She did. Yep. Yep. That was awesome. Man, so many of these great these great character traits and principles that are just kind of woven throughout all of these people that we're talking to. And as you hear their stories and the way that they find strategies for hope in their lives as they as they do big things, it's it's yeah, so fun, so awesome. I love it. Truly, you will enjoy. I can guarantee it. Uh, this amazing conversation that we had with Audrey Gruss and share it. We talked a lot about uh, again her her uh, organization or foundation is hope for depression, right? We talked a lot about the state of depression and how we can learn to support those around us and how we can find help. And yeah, share, share this one. It's some, something that a lot of people could hear and I, and I hope it'll do a lot of good. So please enjoy this episode of the hope strategy podcast. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. 
I'm gonna show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was. I'm experienced now. Changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinle. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of time with us today. Lovely meeting you. I'm just getting settled in here. Yeah, and thanks for, I know you had a, like a family emergency or something come up before when we were supposed to talk. So thank you so much for rescheduling and getting getting on the calendar. We were really excited to talk to you and it's, it's going to be fun. We'll hopefully have a, an awesome conversation here. Oh, that's so nice. So the Hope Strategy Podcast, just a quick background. Yes. Josh and I are Josh and I are business partners. We run a digital marketing agency, a, a international marketing agency with offices here and in Asia, and we work with a lot of really cool brands. Um, whether it's the bigger brands that we work with, like Hotels. dot com and Marriott, and some big brands where we do stuff for them internationally marketing. And I know you've got a lot of marketing consulting and marketing work background as well that we'll talk about, or you know smaller startups and stuff that we work with. But in, in early twenty twenty. Obviously, it's been a crazy year and Josh and I were kind of reassessing the overall direction of the company as we were looking, okay, who are we going to work with moving forward? You know, we've, we've lost some clients as a result of the you know, pandemic and sure. things changing and we're having to pivot and we need to be smart about this. And so one thing that's been kind of at our core always as a partnership and one thing that we've always had in common is that we just, we have an abundance mentality. We want to provide value to people. We're hopeful, optimistic people. And we try to build our company around kind of some of these themes. And so we started talking about working with brands that inspire hope and targeting those brands and saying, Hey, we want to work with brands that see the world the way that we do. And we started talking about talk. And then we started talking to these people and we said, why don't, you know, we've always talked about doing a podcast. Why don't we just start talking to these people about hope and their hope strategies. A lot of people say hope isn't a strategy. We say, well, sure. If you just have hope and sit around and twiddle your thumbs, sure. That's not a strategy. But if you implement hope in everything that you do, then good things tend to happen. Right. And so that's, that's the background. And so we just talk to individuals, uh, whether it's entrepreneurs or religious leaders, or in your case, you know, an amazing businesswoman and philanthropist to understand, you know, their background and where they're coming from and kind of humanize them and talk to them and then hear how they've implemented, you know, hope and seen hope throughout their life and in an effort to inspire and uplift and motivate people uh, that listen to the podcast. It's a wonderful concept and I'm very proud to be um, on it. Well, I'd like to start. So I want to get in all, you know, talk about the Hope for Depression Research Foundation. We want to talk about hope fragrances and and the right. mission there where I where we always like to start. And it's I'm really excited to start here with you because of your background is fascinating based on the research that, that we've done. We want to hear where you're coming from a little bit. So you were born in Lithuania, right? Oh, boy, you know everything. <laughs> I, hey, I've done my research. Oh, we're, going, we're going back to the I beginning. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I was born in Lithuania and our family, my father's family, actually goes back centuries um, and the name is in the Vatican. Our last name in Lithuanian is Butvidas uh, or broken down Butvidas, which means to be a leader. And when the wow. Holy Roman Empire traveled north from Rome to conquer and Christianize the lands, Lithuania was the last country to stay pagan. But it, it became um, Catholic, Roman Catholic, and uh, my father's, I guess, family and the ancestors had lands that were taken over by the Romans. So when my sister did some research, went to the Vatican, she saw the name in the Vatican, which I think is very fascinating. So it it's is a fascinating. very, very long time background. But my family fled, my parents fled communism and during World War II or toward the end of World War II or right at the end or after World War II, they fled Lithuania and then went to France and Germany and then came to the States. I was just born. I came to the States when I was uh, about five and a half or six years old. Your father served in the Lithuanian army, right? And, he, and so he had to kind of flee the Russians as they came in and took over and, and were taking over Lithuania. Is that right? I, 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 I read so cool. My father was so cool. When the Germans came through, they put him in prison and he wouldn't collaborate with them. And then when the Russians came through with the American, I guess, uh, army, 
they uh, freed him. Okay. And after that, of course, he, he escaped. He didn't want it because he, you know, when Yalta happened and they, they sold Lithuania down the river and signed Lithuania over to the communists, to the Russians, my father escaped. He was in the cavalry. So my okay. dad rode horses till he was nine. He stopped jumping at 90 and he oh, rode wow. horses till he was 94 years old when he passed away. He was so cool. I mean, the ladies in Wellington at the Palm Beach Polo Club were all dying to ride with him. He had this ramrod straight posture on his horse and he was cool. He was a great guy. I loved him. He sounds amazing. What, uh, what great genes too, riding horses till he was 94. That's unbelievable. Isn't that amazing? Jumping you, to 90. That is incredible. Slipped so, the rain once, which he shouldn't even been riding in the rain, broke his um, sternum. But he was just upset at lunch and dinner that if something was hurting him. We finally made him go to the hospital for his little accident. So did you grow up riding horses as well? Was that part of the family kind of identity growing up? Was that something you all did? We lived in northern New Jersey in Troy Hills, which is near that whole Bernardsville area. And my father, when he first came to the States, instructed, gave equestrian instruction and trained some of the, you know, very good horses in that area. And I started riding as a child. But when I went to college, you know what happens in college. You just get away from your parents. You get away yeah. from everything you want, a whole social life. You want this and that. Forging and your own identity, right? Exactly. So I stopped riding in, in, um, in college. What was that like being raised? I mean, with this, me and Josh were talking before and we were just doing a little bit of discussing before the call. And we were saying, man, kids kids today and including ourselves, you know, the, in our generation, but I, I was joking that this morning I was negotiating with my son who my wife just bought him some really nice pants. And he was like, these just aren't comfortable. I don't want to wear them. I'm like, you know, there's a lot of kids that don't have the luxury of having their mom bring them pants to wear to school that are brand new. You know, they might feel a little different. So what were the lessons that you learned growing up with immigrant parents that weren't just like, oh, hey, let's go live in a new place. Let's, you know, move to a new country. It was, we're fleeing communism. We're fleeing you know, Europe just after, during, and then post, like you said, World War II. What lessons did you learn from your dad and your mom growing up in that environment? Well, first of all, they always thought that it would be temporary. They were very patriotic and, and um, because of, you know, their history in the country, they loved their country and they thought that it would be free and that they would eventually go back. But they did try to adapt immediately to America as well. They learned English. They were intelligent people. My mother was a teacher. What I learned from them was generosity, though. And, and really, my first knowledge even of giving back, I mean, we, we lost everything. My family lost everything. They lived in a beautiful uh, kind of a neighborhood, like it would be a suburb of New York. It would be Greenwich or, or you know, a beautiful town anywhere in, in, uh, in the States. And my grandfather was in the banking um, field and they lost everything. And to start out here must have been amazing. It would be like us going to China, having yeah. to learn Chinese and to start over again, you know, with a child. Actually, they had also had my younger sister in Germany. So there were two children. And what I learned is that they, from the beginning, they started sending packages of whatever it was to their family back, back in Lithuania. Lithuania. Because even though they were newly settled in America, they still were better off. They had jobs. They were working than the people under communism in Lithuania. So they always sent them, I remember sending them uh, cashmere and cloths and textiles because they could sell that. And everything was so needed in communist um, dominated Lithuania at the time. So I really learned about, about giving back. I saw that we had just the basics, but they always thought of their family and others. And then, you know, going to church and always giving to church and, 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 and giving, giving back to people who uh, needed it more than we did. I, I must say I got that from my parents. They were very moral, generous, caring people. 
So Audrey, one of the things I've noticed is that it seems like a lot of immigrants who come to the United States and their children have this success story where they came, they lost everything, they come here and they're wildly successful, but then the grandchildren take it for granted and they lose it all or they wreck their lives or something. But the parents and the children who really grew up with that seem to be extra successful, more successful than the people who grew up here. Why is that? Is it just something about coming from hard things or do you have any insights for us on that? I think I do. You're so right. I mean, you're telling a story that so many successful people with children um, have discussed with me. And I've discussed this with our psychiatrists at Hope for Depression and whatever. I think that when you do lose everything, you want the basic a basic sense of security and the tangibles, a roof over your head, um, a, um, a, a job, uh, food, you know, this is the basic set, whatever causes basic security. And the most important thing that was important to my parents was education. So they worked so hard, but the children had the best of everything. The only thing we had to do was study and do well. I brought home A's because I sensed it. I luckily got both my parents' brains and personalities, but um, I, I felt that that was an understanding and an obligation that you could build back whatever you had through education. I find that, that children are very privileged people who, who, who are in our you know, milieu in, in, uh, in the States have such a problem giving incentive to their children because they give them too much too soon. And there's nothing like earning your own first income, whatever you do, whether it's doing errands at home, doing, doing chores, or getting a job when you're in high school. I started working when I was 16. I just happened to do modeling you know, and then also I remember some summers getting a job as a, a receptionist or secretary and wherever I could. And that idea of the work ethic is something that I saw in my family and I understood. And I, and really, if you earn your own at whatever age, if you earn your own income, you understand the value of money rather than being given so much that you become kind of anti-establishment or bohemian or not, nothing wrong with different lifestyles. But I think the values are learned in having that loss of family, country, everything. And you understand that through education, you can reach a certain socioeconomic level that brings back that feeling of security. Does that make sense, Josh? Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And you're speaking to Josh and I both, Josh has three kids. I have, I have four small kids and we're doing our best to, you know, raise them. And, and so that's, that's very helpful information. And for any of our listeners out there, because a lot of them have kids themselves. And um, psychologically, what you parents go through is you want the best for them. You want to make it easy. You want them to maybe yeah. have what you may not have had, or even if, you know, whatever. It's still, if you had uh, this, you want them to have uh, this and a little bit more, but you can't imagine the incentive, the motivation, the value that they will get out of kind of working for it and for studying sure. hard. There's nothing wrong with studying hard and being good in school and learning the value of working. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting too, is I'm thinking as you're talking is if you, if you look at your, your parents who had this completely different lifestyle than, than we have in the U S or you've had, you know, as you, as they, but they took this leap of faith and, and made this change. They instilled in you, um, hard work. They instilled in you, like you said, the, the first thing you said was to give back. And that, how, how are they to know that years later you would be, a, you know, as successful as you've been and, and that their lesson in simple giving back, going to church and putting whatever they can or sending a package, how would they know that that was going to impact, you know, as many people as it has just by instilling that in you who now later on down the road has your own philanthropic endeavors and, you know, is donating in the way that you have for causes that are so critical. It really gives you pause to think of, you know, 
parenting or, or living your life with foresight, that the, that the lessons that you're helping learn today aren't just so that they'll be good today, but who knows how that's going to come into play 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the road and then generations yeah. to come. Corey, without question, absolutely. Values are instilled right at the beginning of childhood. It's what you see your parents do and what they tell you and what you learn from them. My parents were such moral, good people. To them, they just behaved how they were taught, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's, it's stood me very well in life. So you, you seem to be, and I think it's safe to say that you're very determined, you're ambitious. You know, you, you went to, I read something, you know, you, you went to Tufts University and you got your education there and you were looking at the options as a woman in that day and age of what am I going to do when I graduate? You know, what, am I going to be a doctor? Am I going to be, and, and the options at that time were limited. It was, it was a different world. Did you know throughout your education what you wanted to get into or what was that transition like as a, as a woman in that era, you know, trying to come out of college and start a career? And obviously you built a successful one, which we'll talk about, but what was that like? I think it was much more difficult decades ago than it is now. First of all, in our, my own lifestyle, I wasn't exposed to other things that were available like communications or art history or whatever. Although my parents and my mother especially loved opera and, and art and we always had art around our, our world, you're just not aware of the different careers that you can have. I think that I wanted to be a doctor and it was my mother's kind of um, suggestion to me because it was respect for a high level of education, somebody who helped other people. And you got your um, degree in biology, right? Is that biology. And that's yeah. why I did get my degree in biology. But when I went to Tufts, I found that I was much better in the creative and English areas. I got the highest placement exam in English of anyone at, uh, at Tufts. And awesome. um, I did much better in the humanities than in organic chemistry. I had to redo that one summer. But I think it's a lot of reasons. It's, I mean, I think there wasn't encouragement. It really was viewed at the time that if a woman went to medical school, she was taking the place of a man because she'd get married and have children and, and not continue. I mean, it was, you know, very, very different in the, um, in the 60s and 70s. And so, but I, I really felt that I could use that degree in in a related area where my science and what I learned through science, inductive, deductive reasoning, a very controlled way of learning. I think I needed that. I loved biology and I loved studying where things were clear to me. Maybe the, the difficulty of studying history and having things be vaguer. Do you know what I mean? It's just yeah. we all figure, I mean, we all know what we do better at and what we study better, um, what our grades are better in. So I thought that I could use science, but use my creativity as well, writing, English, some of the uh, applied sciences. So I got a job offer. This was so amazing from the Revlon Research Center, which was one of the most advanced in the country. I mean, I had Picassos on the walls, and I worked for Dr. Earl Brower and Dr. Donald Updike, how I remember. And Dr. Brower was the medical director of the Revlon Research Center, and Dr. Updike was the director of other aspects of research. And yeah. I loved it. I, I had a fascinating time where I was involved in the science. I mean, we were doing rabid eye irritation tests. You know, we were doing animal testing at the time. and. I was taking a certain, they had a product that had certain hormonal levels in it or something. I remember taking things to food and drug in Washington and, and taking applications down there. So it was fascinating for me. But through being there and interacting with marketing people and advertising people, just being exposed to them, I got involved in that world. I, yeah. I thought it was fascinating. I could use my English, my writing skills, and all of that. So my second job was at J.P. Stevens, the oldest textile company uh, in the States. 
Burlington was number one in size, but J.P. Stevens was an old, very quality company. They were starting, and they were always in kind of this called gray goods. They were in non-consumer uh, areas. Okay. And were, were these all in New York? Did you live in New York City at the time? Or was, were these York. all in New York? Right out of college, I lived with two roommates in New York, and that was great fun. Mm-hmm. It was wonderful, and we built you know great camaraderie. But the Revlon Research Center was in the Bronx. I didn't know where it was. I was a New Jersey girl. I had never been there. So I was doing cross commuting. You know, it was really great. I didn't have to hit New York traffic. But my second job was at J.P. Stevens. They were starting a hosiery brand, three brands at, at one time. And they hired me because I had been at a top, you know, consumer good branded company at Revlon. And I became director of advertising and fashion. It was really learning, um, what's, a, what's a good metaphor? I mean, like my feet were to the fire. I learned. Yeah, you're thrown into the deep end. Yeah. I really did. And we took a brand or three brands from zero to 30 million, which was huge at the time. Yeah. One year. In one year, and my mentor was a brilliant man named Donald Newman, Mr. Newman. And Mr. Newman had worked at Scaparelli and some other main, main brands. And I remember visiting 90 of the top 100 retailers in the country and making presentations with like a flip chart where we'd use our iPad. I used a flip chart that I would make. And we presented the concept of these three brands. I had to go find agencies to advertise. You watched the show Mad Men? A little bit, yes. <laughs> Every, everything you're saying, it's all about it's all about advertising in the 60s and into the 70s. Everything you're saying, I'm just picturing, you know, the 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 Mad Men uh, <laughs> series because yes. that's exactly what they did, right? John Hamm was terrific. I binged a little, but it was like that. I mean, you know, it was yeah. a fascinating field. It was great. It, it gave me great opportunity. And because of that work, I was hired by Elizabeth Arden right after Miss Arden died. They had a terrific brand, Elizabeth Arden brand for women in skincare and cosmetics and all her salons were amazing. I got something like five raises in six or seven years. And I became director of advertising and creative services internationally for 55 countries wow. and America. And this was so, all in the space. So at that point, when you had gone to Arden and, and gotten those, those raises, that was how long after you graduated? I mean, that sounds like it was, was that 10 years? 10 years. 10 years. Let me wow, see. What a, what a skyrocket. It was a, really amazing. Um, I remember how excited we all were that a woman at 29 became vice president at American Express. That's a a big deal today, but back then. To break the glass ceiling, too. It was like another era. It was fascinating to be involved with all these countries. And I traveled to Japan and Taiwan and uh, France and whatever. So I really learned a certain type of diplomacy, and I learned about teamwork. We did ads in New York, obviously, and then we had to adapt them. France wanted something completely different than Italy, than China, than South America, than whatever. So it was really a fascinating, uh, fascinating time. At Arden, they offered me a vice presidency, but no raise. Okay. And I left Arden in a huff because I, I started my own international marketing company. And my first client was an Italian pharmaceutical company named Bracco. And they, how did you get that client? Yeah. So if we paint the picture of you're now, you know, in charge of global marketing, it's a big deal, you know, in a time when that was a huge leap forward for women, especially in, in you know, in your career. And then you say, they say, oh, we want you to be a VP, but we're not willing to pay you anymore. And you say, well, then I guess so long, I'm going to start my own. That's a big leap of faith, right? You're, you're, you're putting, I mean, maybe that's some of that, those immigrant lessons you learned from your immigrant parents to say, look, I'm going to leave this behind and take a big leap of faith and make things happen. Then how do you go about getting your first client? Cause that, I mean, it sounds like from what I saw you, that was a pretty big deal. That client was a good company that grew with you a lot. I mean, how did you get that deal? I had met 
through my beau at the time, who was um, Saul Waring, president of Waring and La Rosa. They were the people who brought Perrier to America. Oh, okay. They, they were the agency that did the ads for Perrier. They were the first oh, awesome. order ads. Um, and they were fabulous. I mean, the agency was fabulous. Saul was fabulous. They were all great. But through him, I believe, I met the chairman of one of the divisions of Bracco. And um, he, he said that he was looking for distribution uh, and representation in America, but everybody was asking him for lots of money up front. And um, so I had met him and I already had a plan. I was going to learn a little Italian and make a presentation in Italian <laughs> to him. And I, I took it. 30 hours of Italian from uh, Michel Thomas. He's the man that taught Grace Kelly how to speak French. He was known for his method in French, but he used the same method um, for other languages. And I took 30 hours, and t the key was taping the lessons and re repetition. Uh, it was fascinating. You, it was just fascinating. So I did. I learned Italian, I mean, as a child would speak. But when I had my appointment in, um, and I don't remember if it was in Italy or here at the time, but I remember going over to the advertising awards in Venice. That was really fun. Uh, so it must have been at that time that I met with them, spoke a little Italian, made my presentation, and I got a three-year contract to distribute a new brand of color cosmetics in America. And that was my first client. My second client happened very quickly. The Doral Hotels were doing the Doral Spa in Miami, and um, they had heard of my work, and they came to me and wanted a brand, and I said, let's do something different. And I had heard about the spas in Italy uh, through friends in yeah. Italy, and we, I went to the... Terme di Saturnia, one of the spas that had, you know, these bubbling waters from the center of the earth and all, I got a contract with them to have a contract with the Doral, anyway, and to help negotiate the contract that did the Doral Saturnia Spa, where we brought over mud, we, brought, we made our mud, but we brought over crystals that came from the center of the earth and whatever, it was fabulous brought over the decorator to decorate the hotel from Italy. So it was a fascinating experience. So I had quite a few, you know, a few clients happening quickly and everything was wonderful. And then I got the North American rights to Terme de Saturnia skincare the year that I got married to my husband. It was all very exciting to have your own brand and to work so hard to create something like this, but I was traveling an awful lot and uh, I did, marry a fabulous man who I wanted to be with. So I ended up selling my share of the company to back to the owners of the Doral. That's who, Martin, your husband. That's Martin. Yes. And Who's so at that point, man, a fabulous person in my life and has also through the hard work that he, he did through, you know, uh, an amazing career on wall street enabled me to take my philanthropic instincts to another whole level. Yeah. So let's transition there to that. So you build up your career, you get to a place where now it's a priorities thing. I'm married to this man that I love and I want to be with him more and I want to, you know, but I also have my business that I've built. So you made the decision to sell the business and, you know, walk away. And, and, but like you said, now, now is when it sounds to me like your career pivoted a little bit to this philanthropic mission that you've been on for, for a really long time now, which is, which is amazing. Was the depression research foundation or the hope for depression research foundation, was that your first philanthropic? Was that kind of your first endeavor or the first foundation that you had started? Or was there anything that came before that? Or well, the first thing I want to tell you though, is that Martin never asked me to stop working. I mean, working for, for income. He never asked me to sell my company. He never, whatever. It was just I knew that the time away was so much, you know, so long 
and that my the the, the company dominated my life and yeah. no man wants to be second uh, or whatever so I made that decision to um, to sell the company and by entering Martin's world of um, his family had always been very philanthropic he was philanthropic he had charities that he was involved in that I could be helpful with like Lawrenceville, the school that he, the prep school that he had gone to. We just did, for example, now we just did the Gru Center for Art and Design. Uh, that's probably the most advanced place where people can do STEM work oh, and cool. artistic work. It's just fabulous. You can, you know, look it up. I mean, I could talk about that for hours, but it, we're very proud of that. But there were other things at Lawrenceville, you know, whether it was helping plan the philanthropic dinners there or, or whatever. So I'm thinking of Lawrenceville, my own university. I went back to Tufts and was invited to speak to uh, graduating classes. I started the, um, the Audrey Gruss um, Science Award for Women at Tufts. So I really, Martin taught me and showed me and asked me to get more involved in the philanthropic work that he was doing and that I could do with my time freed up. But I still had so many ideas that um, I kept an assistant who just came from the marketing world for quite a while, you know, because ideas always came to me. I thought yeah. maybe I'll just do another brand or do something, whatever. So I always had that interesting just that, that interest in yeah. commercial marketing, whatever ideas, you know, introducing things. But it was just a matter of timing. My mother had had depression. It was one of the most difficult things as a child to watch your mother struggle. So, that, so uh, she struggled with depression for, for your entire, as long as you can remember? When I was in college, I remember her having a real breakdown where she became catatonic without going into too much detail. And, you know, it, it's so painful when you have any kind of illness in a parent, whether it's yeah. physical or mental, because depression is a medical, physical, and, and mental illness. I mean, it involves your brain. You, have, uh, you can have body pain. It involves everything. But it was so difficult for my two sisters and father and I to watch her go through this. I never knew that yeah. I could help. I always thought that the big pharmaceutical companies were handling this, that they had major research, that they were coming out with new drugs all the time. Because I noticed that my mother was taking new medications. But years ago, they called it a nervous breakdown. I mean, how generic. She had yeah. major depressive disorder. That's what I was going to ask. Like, did you know, I mean, they didn't call it depression back then. They didn't really diagnose it, right? So what, what were some of the symptoms that she was facing and what did you think of this? I mean, you kind of told us how you felt about it, but did you know what was going on? Did you have a feeling for what was wrong exactly? Some of the symptoms of depression, and, and um, there's 10 major ones, and I'm going to try to remember them, but some of them manifest themselves. So whether it's loss of concentration, loss of weight or gain of weight, sleeping too much or too little, having body pain, uh, constant, what is it when you get caught up in your own? Um, anxiety? Uh, anxiety is one of the types of mood disorders related mm -hmm. to depression. It could be the other, the other side of the coin of depression, but it is related uh, sometimes very comorbid at the same time. But some of those other symptoms were you ruminate. You ruminate, oh, okay. you have tremendous guilt. But sometimes there was no, defini no definition. We didn't know. We thought my mother was just acting strangely. And um, they didn't have, but, then they didn't have these 10 definitions. I mean, that wasn't something that you had at your disposal. Not. And when she had, for her, a nervous breakdown, she literally became catatonic. Uh, couldn't move, couldn't talk, couldn't anything. We had an ambulance take her to a hospital. The point is that in, I would say, the late 50s, 60s, maybe she had that before I was in college. So she, the doctors didn't tell us anything. You weren't allowed to talk to the family. 
they told us that my mother had a nervous breakdown. My sisters and I thought we, we were the ones that broke her nerves. We thought we were bad. How do you break nerves? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was so difficult to understand. My father was just very upset that, that my mother was ill. You know, mental illness, you never even thought of the mental illness. People, you know, other children could be very nasty. They would say you have a crazy mother or she acts so strange. What's wrong with her? Um, it was a very painful thing. It's painful as a child. You feel different. You feel that you have to protect her. You feel you can't talk about it. If you talk about it, you don't really know what to say. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Even if your parents have an illness and they're at home, you don't know what to say as a child. You don't know how to deal with it, that they're not feeling well, that they're very sick. You don't want a sick parent. You want the parent to be like something that you've always known. So as I said, you learn ways of coping. And I remember when my mother had been treated by a very good doctor and was then living in a senior citizen home. My father wanted to stay in Palm Beach and ride horses and, you know, follow his equestrian life. And my mother wasn't very happy in the heat and couldn't handle it. So they geographically separated. So she lived up north in Greenwich and dad lived in Palm Beach, in West Palm Beach. And I remember going to see my mother and it would be like going from my world and then going to see her and feeling I would do anything to make her feel better, but I didn't know what. I thought, what could I do? I got her the best doctors. She was in a great facility. At a certain point, she was very happy and very balanced and controlled. And then she'd have breakthroughs and fall into deep depression, whatever, you know, set her off. Kind of the beautiful, you know, tender mercies in this whole thing is that your mom's name was Hope. Right? I unbelievable. Think Isn't that unbelievable? The irony of that is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So what's hope in Lithuanian? Was that was she what was the is that was that what Viltis. she was called there? Viltis. V I L T I S. Viltis, okay. So but she was called Hope from when she came to the States. So again, your your husband and you you start working on these philanthropic endeavors. Your mom, you you had seen firsthand the impact that depression had had on not just her life, but obviously we understand, you know, and I think all of us know somebody, if not ourselves, that have struggled with some of these things. And it impacts, you know, the everybody around you, your circle of influence, right? It's, a, it's definitely something that, and, and I do think that, and you would know this better than anybody because you've watched and you've been so invested in this for so long, how it seems now that we're able to talk about anxiety or depression and some of the specific more, you know, more um, specific types of depression or mental illness much more openly, I feel like the, the, a lot of that stigma and stuff has, has become much more healthy. How have you seen that transition since you've been really heavily invested with your time and obviously resources in, in this endeavor of, of helping find a cure for depression? Well, next year will be the 15th year that we've been working so hard to raise awareness about depression and its related mood disorders and to do major research with some of the top doctors. I really believe that, that our foundation, which is the leading foundation for depression, only, you know, depression, some, uh, there's not that many private foundations that are doing work anyway on the brain, and they may focus on schizophrenia and, and these other parts of mental health, but depression represents I would say depression and its mood disorders, 95% of mental health illness, non-psychotic mental health illness. And we have worked so hard in trying to raise awareness through our fundraising, through the race of hope that we do, through the publicity that we generate by our events and all of that that I know that something that started with, you know, a hundred women that came to my first lunch is now 350 people, men and women, and thousands on our, on our um, database, in our database. And um, I, I think that I know, you know, people, 
come to me and say, when is your hope lunch? When is the depression yeah. lunch? I mean, just from my own observations, but we know from general reactions to everything we do and all that there's been tremendous awareness and growth in the celebrities who have come forward in the media people magazine now every month does the feature on um mental health mm -hmm. and features some aspect of it and some people who are involved and i think that reaches a huge audience so i personally and my my staff we all have seen the growth in awareness and the ability to even say the word depression. I, I got involved because someone came to me and said, could you donate a building for mental health research for the whole spectrum of mental health? And I said, absolutely not. I prefer not to do bricks and mortar. I don't care if our name is on the bricks and mortar. I want to do research because I had spoken after my mother's death I've spoken to her psychiatrist, to other neuroscientists that I was introduced to. You know, it was just like kind of a domino effect. You talk to one person, they suggest you speak to somebody else. And I very luckily spoke to people in the neuroscience field who told me about the reality of what was happening. Nine, uh, sorry, seven of the leading pharmaceutical companies 15 years ago were out of the brain research business because of many reasons, but primarily they, it was too expensive and they yeah. weren't get, it's so, it's so taxing and so difficult and so slow. They weren't getting the end results and pharmaceutical companies are for-profit companies. They do a great job in, in many ways, but I can understand where once their patents stop, they aren't making the billions that they're making from certain medications when they go yeah. generic. So there are changes economically and there are other reasons why they get out of the mental health and research area. So also a lot of the top scientists were being uh, recruited overseas where people paid more in Singapore or other areas. So there was an evolution happening where research was really in a mental research was in a crisis and I was introduced to two brilliant neuroscientists used them as the scientific directors initially and I literally started from the ground up I incorporated hope for depression research foundation using my mother's name got this group of doctors to put together a research plan and we started literally funding research 15 years ago, my dream had always been to have a task force. And I created the Depression Task Force seven years ago, where we got, at that time, eight of the leading neuroscientists in different fields of neuroscience to come onto this task force, do a, an overall strategic plan for what they could do to find out the inner working is the basis of depression. What were the brain circuits of depression? What was involved in the, the cycles of depression and how it cascaded in the brain and then down the line to genetics, to molecular, to cellular research, et cetera. Top doctors, right now, Dr. Eric Nestler, who was the head of the Society of Neuroscience is on our depression task force. We have 10 of the leading brains. And my one thing that I insisted on from the beginning, I wanted them to work together and share information. And you have the most competitive arena in brain science, as you do in your world, as you do in any kind of business field. Doctors were working in silos or researchers were working in silos. Yale didn't want to tell Harvard, didn't want to tell Johns Hopkins what they were working on. When they published their papers and got all the credits and laudation, of course, they raised more money for their individual labs. I mean, I'm being brutally honest, but that was the reality. Yeah. Um, so our insistence that the doctors share information was an amazing request, an amazing direction and made us tremendously forward thinking. 
And all the doctors have confirmed that. That's why we got the top of the top to work with us. The rock stars of depression research. 10 that minds are better than one, especially when those 10 minds just happen to be incredibly smart and intelligent, right? That collaborative effort is obviously going to do much better than you can in a silo, like you said. Unbelievable. And we have a, a HOPE data center at University of Michigan, since it simply costs less in Michigan than it does in New York, where the doctors, as soon as they finish their research, as soon as they complete it in real time, they input it into the data center and all of the other doctors can view that and then work with it. And we share the data on the animals that we test. We, we share everything. It has been an amazing collaboration. If you speak to some of these doctors, they will tell you how exceptional it has been to be funded and work with HDRF. So what are, what are some of the biggest breakthroughs? I mean, this, that's amazing. That's, uh, that's unbelievable that you've been able to unite that task force, that you've been able to kind of break down those barriers Thanks. in communication. That's, that's awesome. Uh, what, what are some of the biggest breakthroughs that you've seen, you know, in, that have come from these tasks, this task force that you've put together and all of the research that's been, been done over the last 15 years? What are some of those biggest breakthroughs you've seen in, in depression? One research? of the main things through this task force has been that we are now in clinical trials in two places with a, a drug, a new medication called Tianeptine that was approved in Europe and South America, I believe, but not in the States because it was required to be taken three times a day. And that kind of dosing just never works. It just doesn't work. So we developed variations of Tianeptine determined how it functions and are now testing it in clinical trials as a new category of medication. And this is one of the main points that I want to get across. 35% of the people who need medication, who struggle with depression and its related mood disorders, do not respond to the existing medications that are out there, which for the most part are SSRIs and SNRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. 35% do not respond. They struggle. They're unhappy. They, they drink. They take other self-medications. They're the people who are cranky every day, who you run into and they're never happy and they criticize and they blame and they're miserable and they're whatever. These are the 35%. So most of the medications are SSRIs. There has been no new category of medication for general use since SSRIs were introduced with, with Prozac. That was the first SSRI in 1985. Wow. Over 35 years ago. It is shocking that we have a new cell phone every few months, that we are going to the moon, that we're whatever. And with 30% of our people in America, 100 million people struggling now with depression and anxiety, according to a census bureau that was done. And that's, of course, because of the pandemic. One third of Americans are struggling with depression and anxiety. Our basic numbers are 20 million a year. Now we're talking about 100 million a year. It is amazing that people don't know the facts. Depression's number one for disability in the world, according to the World Health Organization. It's not, it's not infections, it's not uh, whatever, it's depression. 35% of people don't respond to the existing medications and the SSRI Prozac type medications are 35 years old. There's one breakthrough that happened with ketamine. Ketamine's been around as a Club K, as a, a horse tranquilizer, and they did find a new use for it as a very immediate, fast-acting, but short-acting yeah. antidepressant, and it, it has to be given in a doctor's office and all of that, and it's not for general use, but I mean, any breakthrough is good. So the use of Tianeptine, if we find that it works in our clinical trials, would be a major, major development. 
we also have done kind of molecular and cellular and genetic research that I need one of my neuroscientists to explain to you. I just know that we've developed a better understanding of the circuits in the brain, the cascades in the brain, the basic biology of how depression happens. And when I talk depression, um, Josh and Corey, to the two of you, I'm talking about depression, bipolar depression, which they used to use called manic depression, postpartum depression, anxiety, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is a form of depression, and the ultimate form is suicide. Depression is the number one reason for suicide. And we're seeing, so, like you mentioned it was since, you know, obviously 2020 has been an absolute whirlwind, but with the pandemic and the lack, you know, everybody being cut off from one another and the anxiety and the fear and the angst that's, you know, that's just been omnipresent this entire year. I mean, that that's one of the things that's not talked about as much is the, the insane increase in depression and anxiety. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's really quite dramatic, you know, I mean, what, what do you see as, or I guess, I mean, you've seen so much. One of the things I was, I wanted to talk about in some of the research I've done is, you know, you've worked with amazing scientists, neuroscientists, like you mentioned, you've also worked with amazing celebrities and other brilliant people to hear their yeah. stories. Yeah. Um, you know, what's, what, out of all these stories that you've heard, what advice would you give to somebody right now who is in that cycle of the medicine, you know, maybe they are on medication and it's not working or maybe it's, you know, postpartum or maybe it's PTSD. I mean, the, you know, there's a broad range here, but what have you seen works? Maybe, maybe more from like a, a habit standpoint or a, a lifestyle standpoint, you know, I, what, what advice would you give to somebody that was struggling with depression and was having a hard time finding light or hope in, in the darkness of depression? Talk to somebody. The most important thing that we as people can be, is sensitive and aware. If, if anyone in our family, our loved ones, our associates at business, if anyone exhibits these 10 signs of depression, even without knowing those 10 basic signs of depression, if they act differently than what you're accustomed to, and, and you know that they're acting unhappy, even, you know, bursting out crying or just gently crying, withdrawing, not eating, eating too much, um, sleeping too much or too little. Anyway, a change in behavior. If you notice a change in behavior, gently approach them and say, I consider you a friend. Talk to them gently, suggest that they get help. Say that you'll go with them to their internist just to talk to them. Say that you'll go to maybe the local hospital has support. a clinic or support, any kind of support group, support place. You can call your local hospital and they'll direct you. If you're at college, go to your, your school nurse. And now there's some wonderful organizations that do work in colleges. Speak to that person, offer to go with them to get help and to talk to somebody because you really could be saving lives. You know, a big part of this is just that communication, right? When you, when you do hear the stories of, you know, suicide and the most kind of extreme form of depression, like you talked about, or people that have gone years and years with, you know, eating disorders because of depression or, you know, these different, yes. these different symptoms from it, you know, you, you hear so often the people that are closest to them, that love them the most that say, I, I just, we didn't, I didn't know, you know, I didn't. And, and, and sometimes I guess even maybe worse, I, I had an idea, but I didn't say anything. I think that communication, just getting it, that it, it's absolutely, it heals, it heals things and it helps you understand things and talking about things and understand it helps you understand them better. And then obviously from there, you can come up with solutions and strategies and build a support team. I think that's critical. And I, again, I've seen that in my, in my own life with the, you know, the people in, around me. So I want to talk also about, you know, before we wrap up here about the hope, hope fragrance. I love the story that I saw where you talked about a tie between flowers, your mom, hope again, and then this idea for a fragrance and how that those things all came together. Can you tell us a little bit about hope fragrances and how it came to came to be? 
Can I tell you a little bit? I can tell you a lot, but I'll try to keep it very short. You know, research is very slow. And 15 years of research or the last seven years of research with our depression task force even is considered, you know, nothing. It's so, so it, because normal research takes so long. Neuroscience research is very, very slow, ponderous, and exacting. And it takes years to get breakthrough information or results or something that we can uh, talk to our database about or our audience. We want to raise awareness, get lots of information out so that people know some of the statistics we've been discussing. And I thought, what could I do that gets more information out there and gives me more of an opportunity to get to the media and raise awareness about depression. So a thought kept coming back to me, and it's my mother's love of fragrance and her love of white flowers. My mother, every third week in May, would go to whatever garden we had and take me out, even as a little girl and even until I went away to school, and we'd cut Lily of the Valley and bring it into the house. And she loved also a very special fragrance called tuberose, a uh, very sophisticated fragrance. And the, the brand at that time was Fraca. So I remember my mother mixing her Christian Dior Lily of the Valley fragrance with her Fraca. And when she went to Florida to live in Florida, she fell in love with Jasmine and Gardenia. And she added those to her, um, to her likes. And so I would see her four beautiful bottles on the table and spraying these bottles, et cetera. And I thought, you know, if we could get, if we could get an insert into our package of fragrance and tell the backstory of this fragrance, and if we could sell thousands of bottles of fragrance, tens of thousands, we hope, or more, as it becomes popular, we would be able to spread our message so much more quickly and so much more so much more rapidly than just waiting for research information that we could give out to our media people and to the media so i decided to do a fragrance named after my mother whose name was hope and i wrote a protocol for what it would be like and it was first based on her white flowers her love of white flowers and I went to the top three companies in the fragrance field to see who would work with me and who would work in the most economic way, since we're a nonprofit, obviously. So I had to start a new company, Hope Fragrances International, the intent of, of becoming international someday. And I remember going to Firminish to meet the president of Firminish, which is one of the top three. They're based out of Switzerland, but they are worldwide. He loved the concept. He thought it was just so wonderful to be able to have a fragrance that gave back. And my marketing concept was that 100% of net profits would go right to depression research at Hope for Depression Research Foundation. And that's how it started. Firminish loved the concept. They gave me one of their top noses. The noses are the perfume designers. We ended up with Dominique, but Pierre Negrin designed one of the, one of the fragrances. And Dominique, and, uh, who's a world-class perfume nose and designer, worked with me and designed the original Hope, which is based on those four flowers, Lily of the Valley, Gardenia, Jasmine, and Tuberose. And the fusion of them creates something so magnificent, so powerful. It's just like some unique thing that is better than the individual. The whole and, and, and hope is just so special. Then when we went to Bergdorf Goodman, who loved the concept, Bergdorf Goodman wanted a collection and we added Hope Sport, which is for the woman who's very active, who ends up in her exercise clothes all day long, as I often do. So a lot of people we know, and especially now during the pandemic, we're all in our casual wear. 
this hope sport is the, the the fragrance that you you spray in the morning and that lasts with you through all your activities very sporty activities errand driven etc and then we decided to do a hope night and the hope night is so romantic so sensual, so beautiful, and very long-lasting. I happen to have them right here. Here's the original Hope, a beautiful, oh, it's beautiful, yeah, beautiful, simple crystal bottle that is as uplifting as our authentication line. So very long, elongated neck, beautiful crystal on top or glass. I love you know, it. It's acrylic. It's acrylic, and then the glass bottle that has Hope, 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 Hope all around it a gold elongated neck and it really is lovely so that's the hope original the hope sport has a silver or chrome mm. neck this elongated neck and a it's very green it's very yeah fresh it's very natural it's like the smell of rain after it falls on grass or in nature that kind of very fresh easy clean feeling and then for nighttime hope night it is delicious and sexy it has plum and amber and vanilla patchouli vetiver and two of the white flowers I love it Leo so are the, are the white flowers kind of a, a base or a part of all it's of a DNA. It's the DNA it. of our brand is the original hope and both sport and hope and hope night hope sport and hope night have some of the white flower in there because it's the DNA and it kind of gives it a very special little aroma and a little well, essence. The, yeah. The story of that is so I love, I love that so much that it's, you know, it's not just the, Hey, I came up with these good, you know, these flowers that smell good, but I love that there's such a, a foundational tie to you and your mother who again who's named hope and the foundation i mean it all you can tell that there's you know it's meant to be right there's too there's too many uh there's too many good serendipities in this whole story to uh to not be i, I think I, I love that i love that. it seems like you have so much you're so intentional you know to be able to take that idea and that concept and say these flowers remind me of my mom i remember the fragrance fragrances and the smells how could I pull these together to make something special? And then not only that, but then to take 100% of the net profit and say, now this is going back into the foundation that was named after her in the first place. It's such a beautiful story. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. I'm very excited about the fragrance brand and we're online and we're also on uh, Rodrigo Goodman's line. What is, the, is it hopefragrance.com or what's, what's the website for the fragrance? It's hopefragrance.com and it's bergdorfgoodman.com. And we hope, of course, to expand to retailers around the country. But I'm, I'm very proud of what Hope for Depression Research Foundation has accomplished in the last 15 years. And I'm, I'm very excited about Hope Fragrance. And I love talking to the two of you. And the, the website for the Hope for Depression uh, Research Foundation, is it hdrf.org? Uh, yes, or hopefordepression.org okay, okay. if you want to type it out. Yeah. So go check both of those out and, and, and follow them on Instagram. I looked them, you know, I saw the Instagram and the, and the Facebook pages and stuff where you're kind of giving updates on, on the product, but also on, yes. on the foundation and all the work that you're doing. I think it's so um, fantastic and amazing and something, you know, some, you're, you're somebody for a lot of people to look up to, to somebody that's, you know, come from a, you know, we heard your background and made something of yourself. And then not, not only that, but you instilled those lessons that you learned from your parents at a young age to give back and this whole foundation and everything that you've done is, is so awesome and uplifting and, and so full of hope. So we, we really appreciate you telling us the whole story and taking some time with us today. And I know, I know people are going to love listening to your story. Corey, thank you so much. And Josh, so lovely meeting you. And, you as well. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it really is. It really is fantastic. I don't normally do this, but I will tell you because I did look through all of your, your stuff, you know, your website and your social media and everything. If there's ever anything we can do to contribute and help, let us know. Cause I mean, that's our world. That's what we, you know, that's the world that we live in on the, on the marketing side and the advertising side and the social media stuff and everything. So if there's ever anything we can do, let me know. We'll let you know about our race of hope in New York and Florida. 
and will will definitely send you the 10 signs of depression. I think that would be a community, uh, you know, uh, thing that you could do that would be very helpful. Yeah, I think anything we can I, do to help spread the message and help you guys out, we're, we're happy to do it. We'd love to be involved. Thanks so much. Thank you, Audrey. It's great to meet you. It's an absolute Have pleasure. Great holidays. Thank and you, you too. Two wonderful people, and I absolutely don't want to lose touch. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Audrey. Thank you so we'll much, Audrey. Touch. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye. Hello, it's Corey here, and I just want to thank you so much for listening into the Hope Strategy Podcast. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are enjoying having these amazing conversations with these incredible individuals talking about hope. We'd love it if you wouldn't mind liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts and share it with anybody you feel that can benefit from these messages of hope. Thank you so much for listening to the Hope Strategy Podcast.